So Rise of Powers of X is amazing, and the ending of this is so awesome. It's, it's absolutely mind-blowing. But what this does is this opens 10 years in the future, right? The Tower of Nimrod the Lesser, the human machine monolith on Earth. And what we end up doing is picking up with what is in effect the annihilation of pretty much all of the mutant population. There's very few that are left here. And in fact, this has a huge number of callbacks to everything that's happened so far. So starting with Omega Sentinel and the nature of like Enigma, the Dominions, all that kind of stuff, let's explain this because I think it's one of the things that a lot of people are curious about. So Dominions are basically the end result of any kind of technological advancement in any particular universe reaching its final form. And it's like an amalgamation of artificial intelligence. It's the reason why, as we saw over the course of Immortal X-Men and things like that, that the goal of Sinister was to basically make four clones of himself and they were all gonna go forward and they were gonna learn everything they could about any particular form of information that's out there of power, right? Magic and science and all that kind of stuff. All that information that was gained by Dr. Stasis and the Mr. Sinister that we thought was the only one who had the diamond on his head, Mother Righteous, Orbis Stellaris, those four clones of Sinister, all the information they gained was at all times being sent back to a central database. And the intention was for that database to achieve a kind of singularity, right? Self-awareness. And that when it achieved that point, it would become a dominion. It would transcend all space and time and exist out there beyond virtually everything. One of the things to know here is Omega Sentinel comes from a time when that was in the process of happening. That Inferno issue number three, what we learned is that in the future she comes from, that in effect mutants had wiped out pretty much all of humanity as well as anything related to machines, right? So Nimrod, Sentinels, the whole nine yards. And in fact, mutants had ruled the entirety of the solar system and even the galaxy. There came a point where there was an effort by Omega Sentinel and humanity, kind of a last ditch effort to basically call in dominions, right? Right, to literally reach out and to basically say, we as humanity have achieved technological advancement, you know, come and find us, right? The truth is that they were lying, but the idea was to bring the Dominions in, and in doing so, the Dominions would wipe out the entirety of the mutant population, given how powerful they were. The result was that the mutants ended up channeling the power of the Phoenix Force and wiped out all the Dominions, right? At least those who showed up in their universe, Titans, if you want to call them that, right? Just these giant robots, right? Literally giant space robots. It's kind of crazy. But basically, she's been trying to prevent that that future from happening ever since by wiping out mutants. Hence the reason why she's been working with Orcus the entire time since the beginning of Jonathan Hickman's X-Men run. The kicker about all this is that even when her and Nimrod leave, and they talk about this idea that tomorrow is when they meet their new gods, they intend to summon a dominion to the universe. Because what that will do is it will allow humanity and machines to merge with the dominion and then just kind of become one or become part of something much bigger than themselves, right? It's like the Borg from Star Trek, more or less. And so what they do is when they leave, you end up finding out that Emma Frost, while she is kind of hanging on and died almost immediately after they left, she had used her telepathic abilities to trick Nimrod and to trick uh, Omega Sentinel into believing that there was nothing else there, that it was simply just her. Now, how she managed to use her powers on Nimrod in that capacity, I'm not entirely sure, because historically speaking, telepathy does not work on robots in Marvel Comics. But be that as it may, we end up finding out that basically Mystique and Gambit are here as well, and they're the last two. But they were on a mission to gain information. And what they have done, or at least what Gambit does, is using his ability to basically ignite kinetic energy from potential energy, he kind of blows an escape hole that gives Mystique the ability to contact Professor Charles Xavier. And while it is successful and she is able to relay to them the information they need for the mission they're on, which we don't necessarily know what it is yet, she of course dies in the process, which kind of makes sense, right? I mean, this really feels like 1990s comics. I'm not gonna lie. The other thing that we learn is that all that's left of the mutant population on Earth is what you see here. And even then, one of them's not actually a mutant. 
So Professor Xavier is here, but it's not really Professor X. Instead, what we're told is that his body had been ravaged by his powers, and so Sync is holding on and holding him together. Sync is, of course, a mutant that has the ability to effectively channel the powers of anybody else. And so what it looks like is Sync is playing the role of Professor Xavier, and maybe Xavier's consciousness is in there somewhere, but he's basically using telepathy to kind of act as Xavier. Tony Stark has long since been dead, and all that's left is an an AI imprint in an Iron Man suit. He doesn't actually have a face or a body or anything. Kamala Khan's here for reasons that nobody understands. And then you have Shadow Tiger, right? Basically, Kitty Pride, who had achieved the Death Seed. Now, the thing about the Death Seed in Marvel Comics is the Death Seed and the Life Seed you never really see these. And for a time, they were cool, especially during the Dark Angel saga. What was it, Uncanny X-Force? That was an amazing story. Oh my God, we need to go back and cover that, man. Like, when he rescues Apocalypse, dude, that was so dope, man. It was, dude, Strife. Oh my God, dude, that was such an amazing story. But in effect, the Death Seed, it doesn't have a lot to do with Celestials and stuff like that. We don't have to go into all of that. Suffice it to say, with regards to Kitty Pride, it modifies and amplifies her powers to a degree, but it also twists her personality, so much so that she kind of becomes Thanos-like in the sense that she basically worships death and sees death as something to be pursued, as opposed to somebody in possession of the Life Seed, which is pursuing the idea of life. And then of course, you have Wolverine, right? And it's Wolverine. Wolverine always lives. He's always here. And so following that, you switch over to the Orcus Forge, which is out there in deep space. Now, because this is a different timeline outside of the main Marvel Universe, it's entirely possible that unlike what we've seen in the X-Men comics up to this point, the destruction of the Orcus Forge and seemingly everybody therein, that in this universe, they seemingly survived and actually moved beyond the sun and went out into deep space where they couldn't be easily found by the mutant population. Well, the important thing here is there is a conversation unfolding. Maura McTaggart comes along and she says, I saw something similar in one of my lives in my sixth life. It was 1000 years from now. Here, now, incredible. And the response of Omega Sentinel, it is Moira, a simple plan really. I brought the knowledge of the technology from the far future where the mutants defeated us to the present day, where they're unprepared. It took five years to build what we needed and then we aimed it at Mars five years of it working, and now we have a world mind. It will attract a dominion who will bring us into the larger whole. All our data, part of a perfect machine outside of time and space. The response of Maura McTaggart, finally safe. Now here's the thing about Maura McTaggart, right? And it's one of the things that kind of threw people off and I do think it's worth reminding people here, right? Maura McTaggart for the longest time in Marvel Comics was just a mutant geneticist. That's all she was, right? A mutant would show up on the doorstep of Professor Xavier and say, I need help learning how to use my powers. He wouldn't understand how those powers work. So we'd take them to Maura McTaggart and Maura McTaggart would run a whole bunch of scans and then say, here's how their powers work. Xavier would take that information and if they joined the X-Men, develop a training regimen and then go forward from there. The big change that was made to Maura McTaggart in recent years is that she's a mutant and when her power activates, every time she dies, the timeline resets. Seemingly, the entire universe reset. It was a little cloak and dagger in the beginning when Hickman was working on it, and we didn't know the full scale and totality of how things were impacted. But going through the events of Inferno, the later stories during Hickman's run, and even during Sins of Sinister, when she dies, all of the timeline resets and goes back. But because the events transpired that led to her dying in the first place, that universe becomes an alternate reality now, right? So every universe where she's reborn, that becomes the main Marvel Universe, right? We're currently in her 10th life, right? The 10th life of Maura McTaggart. And so the cool thing about this is while they are trying to draw a dominion to this reality or to this universe, and in turn, they're trying to join this dominion, right? One, with an AI singularity, basically, that they're met by Dr. Stasis. Now, Dr. Stasis is wildly interesting here. And in fact, what's gonna happen at the end of this is gonna completely and totally blow your minds. And so what happens when Maura McTaggart asks him, right? Like, why are you here? He says, I know, I know, don't worry. I'm doing my job. If you can't beat them, join them. You don't need to slap me down like Faye Long. However, I come with good news. Another of the X teams are down 
wiped out. The bad news is they died having breached certain files, including your personality imprint of Fei Long. Now, didn't Fei Long know where you were keeping, quote unquote, he who must not be named? The response of Omega Sentinel? Immediately beef up security, right? They're gonna be coming here. And so at that point, you basically pick up with the X-Men who were on their mission. Iron Man shows up here right to this facility and while you know there's higher levels of alert than there were before, at the end of the day, you would expect Iron Man to be able to hack through this information, even if it's only an AI imprint, it still has all the knowledge of Tony Stark, it can't do it. Not only can it not do it, because of the security systems, the entirety of the Iron Man suit explodes. At that point, in that moment, Orcus becomes aware there's an intrusion on Phobos, right? Basically, the mutants are there trying to gain information. This leads to basically Nimrod and Omega Sentinel traveling through a portal and responding. But what also ends up happening is they activate the world mind on Mars, which begins the countdown of basically drawing one of the dominions to this universe, right? basically absorbing all sentient life and then moving on to the next one. The cool thing here is we follow Dr. Stasis and what he does when he transitions to this new location, right? Basically to Ecuador, the vault down there that he actually gives us this kind of realization or this revelation. He's seemingly the creator of the children of the vault. And this is huge. Now here's the thing. It's an alternate reality. Right, this is a, a this is 10 years in the future and as you guys will see this timeline will meet its fate but we don't know if this is like a giant alteration that marvel's making to the original origin of the children of the vault or if this is unique to this universe but for those of you guys who aren't familiar with the children of the vault because not everybody saw our videos about that comic the children of the vault were the result of literally putting them inside an actual vault where time passed differently and the result of this is that for like every one day, I think it was, that passed in the real world. It was something like 500 years or something along those lines that passed inside the vault, but basically they're hyper evolved, right? So on Monday, you could fight the children of the vault. And then on Tuesday, they come at you again with a whole new set of powers and look almost nothing like they did before because they're just hyper evolved. Not only that, they're actually advanced enough to be able to figure out what it was that killed them. And then the quote unquote machine mainframe, if you want to call it that, right? Like the center of the vault, the thing that kind of runs everything, it'll basically bring them back and it'll evolve them in order to make them immune to what it was, or at least give them powers that can help them overcome what it was that killed them before. So the children of the vault are ridiculously overpowered. I call them God humans, right? That's really what I refer to them as. But the reality here is that with the X-Men and their mission on Phobos, because of the fact that it's drawn the attention of Orcus, Orcus sends in seemingly everyone they can, right? Virtually everybody, like Sentinels, the whole nine yards. So this massive battle breaks out on Phobos. The kicker about all this is that Nimrod and Omega Sentinel are watching this. And the biggest threat that Nimrod sees is Kitty Pride. Now, this is for a couple different reasons. The first is because in more recent X-Men issues, for those of you guys who have not been reading or watching our videos, right? Maybe you're new here. Kitty Pride, as most of you guys know, can just phase through solid objects and stuff like that. She's become this ridiculously capable assassin. And so the idea of her having the death seed, which amplifies her abilities, and then already having the ability to phase in and out of stuff, she could basically survive this whole battle, right? She's like a one woman army. And so immediately Nimrod analyzes the nature of her powers, which Nimrod can do, and then analyzes the most suitable way to defeat her, which is also what Nimrod can do, Boom, knocks out Kitty Pride in one fell swoop, right? She's not dead, but she is incapacitated. And so following that, what you do is you switch over to Omega Sentinel and you get this kind of cool explanation, right? World mind initiation, world mind stable, world mind attempting contact, world mind contact achieved. It's reached out and successfully made contact with the Dominion. The Dominion arrives. And so again, this is one of those things where creating a world mind 
will draw the attention of the Dominion because it's like waving a giant flag, right? And saying, we have achieved a level of technological advancement that we're worthy of your attention and we want to be absorbed into your consciousness, right? To become part of this kind of AI type thing. And so again, you switch back to Dr. Stasis and he says, the AI's plan was clever. Technology from 1,000 years in the future and 10 years to build the future in the present. But AI cannot have ideas, not really. All they do is iterate what has been done before, right? Not that dissimilar from human beings. So I took what they brought back from the future and gave it to the supreme intelligence I constructed from humanity's greatest intellects. Reed Richards, Tony Stark, all these people, the smartest people in the history of the world, their minds have been consolidated down into a singular intelligence. And he says, and in the vault, they've had a lot longer than 10 years to chew over the problem. So the AI are bringing their God here to beg to join it. Instead, let's do the human thing and just kill it, right? So it's one of these things where it's like, let's destroy this dominion, right? It's a really, really cool plan that Stasis has where he's kind of doing his own thing. Because while Omega Sentinel and Nimrod and artificial intelligence, right, machinery, which for the most part, humanity has been wiped out at this point, where machines are looking to draw a dominion into the universe so they can join it, and in the process, wipe out pretty much any and all mutants, if for no other reason than just for good measure, right? Like Omega Sentinel trying to make sure that her future doesn't come to fruition where mutants wipe out pretty much all the dominions. That here, Dr. Stasis actually has a plan of his own. So it's cool because what happens is that as the dominion emerges, Dr. Stasis initiates his plan, right? Dominion attack vector, penetrating corona, chromosphere, photosphere, dominion attack vector, supernova initiated, dominion attack vector, supernova consumed, dominion attack vector, charged, dominion attack vector, preparing for launch. And so in effect, using the power of the sun, he basically wipes out this dominion, right? Destroys this Titan, this kind of singularity AI that's just traveling and trying to absorb any and all sentient life that it possibly can. Jumping back to the conflict between basically Nimrod and the mutants and so on and so forth, that what ends up happening is Kamala Khan tells Sink, we need a distraction, right? Sink says, one last sink. This will kill me, gotta be the right one. And he says, remember Apocalypse? I do, here's a reminder. And in doing so, pummels Nimrod. Now, here's the cool thing, and it's the fight that we never got to see, right? Apocalypse is a demigod, right? This guy got his powers from the celestials and technology. He can give himself virtually any superhuman power he wants to, with the exception of things like reality warping, right? But he can alter the physical structure of his body. He can give himself flight, energy projections. He can increase his strength to the point that he was able to ensnare the Hulk, right? We saw that in the old Peter David run and probably even higher than that. So it's cool to see that like Sync channels Apocalypse and fights Nimrod, but like we wanted to see that original fight <laughs> and we never got to see it. The other part of this is the X-Men are still trying to get to their target. They're on a mission, right? It is basically a find and what seems to be a rescue mission. What ends up happening is a kind of portal is created and Kitty Pride grabs Wolverine and throws him to it. When that happens, he arrives in the exact location finding this person and realizing this person's alive, only for us to find out that it's the Mr. Sinister that we've seen this entire time, the one with the diamond on his head, right? Dr. Stasis, he's the clone, right? Like he's the guy who's trying to achieve dominionhood here, right? He's the clone. This is seemingly just the Sinister that's been with the X-Men all this time. What ends up happening is we find out that of course this version of Sinister has a failsafe and he needs time to activate it, but the response of Wolverine is, yeah, there is a failsafe. He pops his claws and kills Sinister on the spot. Now the motivation for that, we're not entirely sure of, right? We're kind of left without any real answers here. But the kicker about all that is again, transitioning back to the goals of Dr. Stasis himself, right? Harnessing the power of the sun, it lets off this massive blast and blows a hole 
through the Dominion itself, right? Just this AI construct. And where you have like Nimrod and those guys who are like, what's happening to our God? At the end of the day, like Dr. Stasis standing there with the children of the vault, they ask this question or kind of make this statement perfect. All of the Dominion's constituent intelligences are being blanked, reduced to pure processing power, lose the software, we keep the hardware and upload whatever we wish. In essence, if this dominion, right, has a consciousness in the form of all the sentient beings that is ever absorbed, right, their essences, their minds, what's happening here is like an ice cream scoop. It's scooping out, right, like this sun is scooping out all those essences. It just leaves an empty husk in its place. Dr. Stasis hears this and he says, we, that's such an ugly word, I prefer I, and he says, activate, and in doing so, kills the children of the vault on the spot, right? And then in turn, harnesses the power of the dominion itself, channels it into himself with the intention of replacing it, of achieving godhood. But in a moment, it doesn't work. It doesn't happen, right? Now, here's the kicker. For those of you guys who have been following the X-Men, this is exactly what the Diamond Sinister tried to do at the ends of Sins of Sinister, right? He tried to achieve dominionhood. He tried to achieve godhood. Mother Righteous just tried to do this in Immortal X-Men. Orbis Stellaris tried to do it in another story. None of them proved to be successful. So the question has to be asked, why? Because what happens is Stasis says, but it worked. The Dominion is an empty husk ready for my mind to take its place. Wait, no, it's being consumed by another Dominion. What's going on? Right at that point, Rasputin 4, basically a mutant who's like a combination of other mutants, pops up on the scene and kills Dr. Stasis on the spot. Only for us to find out the reason why it didn't work is because Enigma beat Dr. Stasis to it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you guys, man, like Enigma's a whole different beast, a whole different beast, right? Because it seemed like he was just gonna be like the Immortal X-Men story, that's it. No, 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 no. What this guy has been doing, right? Sins of Sinister, what just happened in Immortal X-Men, Every time someone tries to achieve dominionhood, right? Basically godhood becoming comparable to the power of Enigma, he shows up and stops them because Enigma exists in all of space and time. And so basically he can watch everything happening across the multiverse all at once. And so all he has to do is just look to his left and down a little bit and he sees a timeline where this is happening and he's like, Nope, and he basically shows up and stops Dr. Stasis from achieving dominionhood in this universe, right? So where Nimrod and Omega Sentinel are like, you are not our AI god, the response of Enigma, oh, I am once a mortal man, but now I am AI, I am Enigma. I am your new god. And he just eradicates Nimrod and Omega Sentinel on the spot. And we get this really, really cool instance, right? Because we're told, or kind of explanation, we're told, once I was Nathaniel Essex, right? This is Enigma speaking, right? He says, once I was Nathaniel Essex, I created four versions of myself to scour reality for ways to become a dominion. The mutant, the post-human, the arcane, the alien, all roads would lead to me. The plan was helped by the industrious mutant clone Sinister. He had made an engine that used Moira's gift to reset the timeline whenever he wished. So each of these attempts could happen. He consumed and then reset. Watching, I ensured he would never remember the timelines when he discovered his peers or their Dominion attempts, i.e. Orbis Stellaris, Mother Righteous, Dr. Stasis. It's the reason why even after the events of Sins of Sinister and all the instances when we've seen the clones of Sinister trying to achieve dominionhood, none of them actually reference the fact that they've done it because none of them know that the others have tried. And so he says, I watched all of this happen as it must. I exist outside of time and space. I am enigma and I cannot be prevented. I am as inevitable as the period at the end of this sentence. You are merely watching how I came to be. You are merely watching how I won. And what we find out is due to Enigma himself, he wipes out this entire timeline, right? Plus 10 stasis timeline, reality ends. And we end up finding out this whole situation is being watched by Professor Xavier and Rasputin 4 
in the present day. They were literally looking at an alternate reality and they were trying to understand how Enigma came into existence. And while this doesn't necessarily give us any definitive answers, what it does tell them is that Enigma is a force out there in the multiverse that's traveling from one universe to the next and stopping any attempt by anyone to achieve dominionhood, right? To basically rival its level of power. And that once that person is stopped, that reality is wiped away, right? It's literally annihilated by Enigma itself, which is an astronomical level of power, the ability to just destroy an entire universe. And so even in the midst of all of this, Xavier says, we succeeded in stopping Stasis Ascension nine times. That's better than what we achieved with the other Essex clones. We knew it was likely impossible to prevent the Enigma Dominion from coming into existence, but we had to try. And now we must walk a harder path. The effort was to find a way to stop Enigma's ascension into power, but it seemingly cannot be done. Enigma always comes to power, right? It always rises to that ability. And so what we get is Xavier talking about a kind of contingency plan. Now Rasputin 4, again, she is kind of a hodgepodge of different mutant powers, right? Colossus, Kitty Pride, X-23, Laura Kinney, so on and so forth. But she is ridiculously powerful, which is why she's here with Xavier because she's kind of his ace in the hole, so to speak. But she will not continue working with him unless he specifies the contingency plan. And what he says is this. He says, very well, I was hoping to spare you the burden of knowing it is more than a walk into the shadow, it is an extinguishing of the light. Next, we strike here, right? Pointing to a spot on the monitor. And the question she asks is what happens then? His response? the whole timeline falls apart and the dominion ceases to be. It's cut off at the root. If we kill Moira McTaggart before her gift activates when she's 13, it all goes away. And Krakoa, everything that's happened will never have been and will never be. In effect, Xavier is trying to reset the timeline to prevent the establishment of Krakoa and everything that we've seen happen since the launch of Jonathan Hickman's X-Men run. With that being said, guys, I told you it was gonna be crazy. If you need to get caught up, make sure you guys click this link to the X-Men playlist and I will catch you all later. Peace.